So this man was driving down the highway, and uh, all of a sudden a rabbit jumped in front of him. He tried to swerve to avoid hitting it, but he, he ended up hitting the rabbit. And this guy was a, an animal lover, so he pulled over, got out of his car to see what had happened with this rabbit. And much to his dismay, uh, he found that the rabbit was the Easter bunny, and it was dead. This is a true story. And so... Uh, <laughs> The, the driver just felt so terrible about this, and so he began to cry. And this woman was driving by and saw this man crying on the side of the road, and so she pulled over to ask what was going on. He said, I just, I feel terrible. I accidentally ran over the Easter Bunny, killed it with my car, and the woman said, you don't worry about it. I, I think I know what we can do. And so she ran back to her car, and she grabbed the spray can, and then she brought it over, and she walked over to the dead Easter bunny, bent down, and started spraying the contents, contents of the can onto the Easter bunny. And all of a sudden, the Easter bunny jumped up, waved its paw at the two of them, and then hopped off down the road. Got about 10 feet down the road, turned, waved again. Hopped another 10 feet, turned, waved again, and kept doing this over and over until it hopped out of sight. Well, the, the man just couldn't believe what had just happened, what he saw, and so he ran over to the woman. He said, what was in that can? What did you spray on the Easter bunny? And the woman turned the can so that the man could read the label, and here's what it said. You ready for this? Hairspray restores life to dead hair <laughs> and adds permanent wave. Yeah. Well, welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Uh, my name's Randy Boffman, after that joke. <laughs> my name's Steve Harley. I'm one of the ministers here on staff at LVCC. We are so glad that you've come out to join us this morning, and I promise you there will be no more cheesy jokes like that uh, today. So, well, for me, uh, some of you guys are going to hang out with your dad today. You're going to hear some more dad jokes, I'm sure. But uh, we are so glad that you are here today to celebrate that the tomb is still empty, and that we serve a risen Savior. So before we jump into the message, I just want to remind you, if you would, take some time to scan our QR codes up on the screen or on the pew backs behind you. There you can register your attendance. You can find message notes for the sermon. Uh, you can find our announcement page, and there's even a tab for, for giving. So last week we started this series, if you were here with us, we, we started this series called Room for Doubt. And for this series, what we're doing is we want you to understand that it is okay to have doubts, that it is normal to have doubts, that there is room in this church for those who have doubts. But we want to use this series as an opportunity to help you to develop a confident faith, a confident faith by tackling some issues and some subjects that sometimes trip, trip people up in their faith. So let me kind of show you where we're going with this series. Last week, if you are here, we talked about doubt. We talked about the upside of doubt, how when we handle doubt properly, this can actually strengthen our faith. And if you missed that message, you can go back to our website and check it out. This weekend, we're talking about the resurrection. Is there really evidence for the resurrection? Next weekend, we're, we're tackling one of the toughest subjects, a pain and suffering. If God is good, why is there so much evil? Why is there pain and suffering? So we're going to tackle that one next week. The following week, we're going to talk about the Bible. Can we, can we trust the Bible? Is it authoritative or is it just a book of mythology? Is it, is it full of contradictions? Then at the end of April, we're going to talk about evolution. Are we just some kind of cosmic accident? Uh, did we really evolve from a single-celled organism? And then finally, we're going to wrap up the series in the first week of May by just handling some miscellaneous questions. And so these are questions that you submit to me throughout the series uh, that you would like for me to answer in that message. So one of the things that we're doing with this series is I'm putting my cell number up on the side screens here. And so if you have a question pertaining to today's message uh, while I'm preaching, you can text in those questions. And as time allows and as my brain allows, uh, I'll come back up at the end of the service and try to answer those questions. And I'll keep the sender anonymous. Um, also, uh, you can text in your questions for May 7th. So if you have a question you'd like me to hit in that miscellaneous topics one, text that in to me as well. Just let me know that that's for May 7th. So again, our hope is that this, this series will encourage you, even in the midst of your doubts and your questions, and help you to find answers that will give you a confident faith. 
And, and if you're not doubting, or maybe if you are doubting and you get that confident faith, uh, we're hopeful that it'll also equip you to help others who are battling with their questions. Well, today with it being Easter, we do want to talk about the resurrection is there evidence for the resurrection? And this is, this is just a super important question. In fact, the Apostle Paul would make it clear that this is the question. This is the central question to the Christian faith. So if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your phone, you can open up to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll also have it up on the screens for you. But we're going to stay in 1 Corinthians 15 for the most part today. And uh, so in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised... Our preaching is useless, and, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, meaning those who have passed away, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we, of all people, are most to be pitied. So Paul is saying that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is central. It is vital to the Christian faith. That the Christian faith actually rises or falls on whether or not Jesus rose from the dead or not. In fact, Paul says that if Jesus did not raise from the dead, there are some major implications here. There's some major fallout. It means this, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, well, then there's no resurrection of the dead, right? Meaning that when we die, well, that's all there is. No eternal life, no heaven if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It means this, it means that our preaching is useless. It's just a bunch of empty words that I, I, I'm up here with if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It also means that our testimony is a lie, that we are spreading lies if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It means this, that our faith is futile. Like, this would be the strangest gathering ever if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, right? Like, what we're doing here is ridiculous if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It means this, that we're still dead in our sin, right? If, if there's no resurrection, we can't be forgiven. It means that we are lost if there's no resurrection. It means that Christians should be pitied. I mean, don't you kind of feel sorry for people who, who buy lies, they believe lies, and live out those lies? If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we, we should be pitied. People should feel sorry for us. And it means, if there's no resurrection, that there's no hope. If there's no resurrection, I shouldn't be up here preaching. I need to quit this job. So this is why it is so important for us to know whether or not Jesus resurrected from the dead. So the question is, is there any evidence to support this claim that Jesus rose from the dead? So before I get into the evidence for the resurrection, I need to say this. For someone to resurrect from the dead, there needs to be something else that happens first, right? That person actually needs to die. And so let me just make this clear. It is, it is a well-established fact that Jesus Christ was publicly executed in Judea in the first century AD under Pontius Pilate by means of crucifixion at the request of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Even the non-Christian historical accounts of Flavius Josephus, Cornelius Tacitus, Lucian of Samosata, and even the Jewish Sanhedrin corroborate the early Christian eyewitness accounts of these important historical aspects of the death of Jesus Christ. Now, there are some Muslims who have come up with a theory. They, they don't believe that Jesus died. Uh, so they've come up with a theory, one, one that, that there was someone else that was on the cross, that it was an imposter. I think Jesus' mother, Mary, might have recognized if it was an imposter. Uh, and the other thing they've come up with is something called the swoon theory, where Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He didn't die at his crucifixion. Instead, he either uh, pretended to be dead or seemed dead. And so he, he swooned. And then when they took him off the cross and they put him into that cold tomb, that revived him. And later he appeared to his disciples and they just dumped, jumped to the conclusion that he had, had, had resurrected when he'd really been alive the whole time. So that's kind of what they think. So let me just quickly put that to rest here. Romans were experts in the art of crucifixion. 
They intended for the victims of crucifixion to suffer greatly and then to die. And they made sure of that death. In fact, if a criminal was on the cross too long for them, they would break their legs below the kneecaps, which would, re, would, which would hasten death. This, the person would die within a matter of a short time. When they came to Jesus, they didn't need to break his legs because he was already dead on the cross. But just to make sure, a Roman guard took a spear and jammed it up underneath Jesus' rib cage and pierced the pericardial sac around his heart. And it resulted in a stream of blood and waters flowing. Jesus died on the cross. Make no mistake about it. There's no good reason to believe that Jesus, or, or any man for that matter, could survive what he went through, fake his death, sit in a tomb for three days without medical attention, food, or water, remove that massive stone that sealed the tomb, and escape undetected without leaving a trail of blood behind. There's no way that he could convince hundreds of eyewitnesses that he was resurrected from the dead and in good health. Such a notion is ridiculous. So, he died. But is there evidence for the resurrection? And here's the evidence I want to give you. I want to give you four evidences of the resurrection. And to try and make it a little bit easier to remember, I'm going to give four E words. And the first E word is the word empty, referring to the empty tomb. In Matthew chapter 27, we read that as evening approached, there came a, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a follower, a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean cloth, clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. So, Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was the council that actually condemned Jesus to death. He had become a disciple of Jesus, but quietly because of the fear of the repercussions. Joseph of Arimathea would have been well, very well known among the people of that day, kind of like a U.S. senator today. And it would have been very clear where, where his tomb was. There would have been no question as to where Jesus was buried. So starting with the women who first visited the tomb and then the men who followed soon after, the disciples of Jesus universally testified that the tomb was empty on that Sunday morning. But the best evidence of the empty tomb is that even the opponents of Jesus implicitly admitted that the tomb was empty. Both Jewish and Roman sources admit an empty tomb. Those sources range from Josephus to a compilation of 5th century Jewish writings called the Toledeth Yeshu. Dr. Paul Meyer calls this positive evidence from a hostile source, which is the strongest kind of historical evidence. In essence, this means that if a fact uh, if, a, if a source, I'm sorry, admits a fact decidedly not in its favor, then that fact is genuine. For instance, it, it'd be one thing for me to say that, that Ohio State is far superior to Michigan in football because I'm an Ohio State fan, right? I, I'm a little bit biased. It would be another thing if a Michigan fan would admit that Ohio State is much better in football than, or that Ohio State is much better in football. Uh, so it would be one thing for me to say that, but it would be another for a Michigan fan to admit that fact, which it is a fact, right? Uh, so they might not like it, but it, it's true. When the disciples began proclaiming that, that Jesus raised from the dead, his enemies said, no, the disciples stole the body. But what they were doing was they were conceding that the tomb was empty. They were just trying to explain how it became empty. So everybody was conceding that the tomb was empty. How it got empty was the real issue. Now, there were Roman guards who had been assigned to protect the tomb of Jesus. And if those guards had been asleep, then they wouldn't have known the disciples had stolen the body. They wouldn't have known what had happened to the body. On the other hand, if they had been awake and seen the disciples stealing the body, they would have stopped and they would have arrested them. And the Roman guards were just extremely attentive to their duties because they were scared to death. They were scared of their superiors. Death by being burned alive was a common punishment if a Roman guard didn't do their job. So clearly this was a, a cover-up story that was designed to mask what had really happened. But it does, again, do one very useful thing for us. It acknowledges that the tomb was empty, and it reveals that the civil and religious leaders really had no idea how to explain it. The next line of evidence is the early accounts of Jesus' resurrection. 
So after the followers of Jesus realized what had happened, that he truly had conquered the grave, they immediately started telling people about it. Now, their reports at first were oral, that's the culture that they lived in, but they were soon written down as well. So Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection would have taken place around 30 to 33 A.D. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they give us early accounts of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Most date these Gospel writings around 50 to the early 60s A.D., 50s to early 60s A.D. Now, some have tried to push for later dates of those writings, but even those would be 70s to 80s. And so either way, they were recorded within the times when people would have still been alive who had seen the events that they were writing about. And yet, their contemporaries did not dispute their accounts. They didn't dispute the resurrection. One of the earliest creeds of the church is believed by scholars to date back to within months within months of the resurrection. Historian James D.G. Dunn said that this tradition, we can entirely be confident, was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. It wasn't come up with later, years later. Within months, they were, they were, this was spreading around. And Lee, as Lee Strobel puts it, he said, that's historical gold. This extremely early testimony affirms what was well known to Christians since that very first Easter Sunday, that Jesus rose from the dead. So here's what that creed said. It was, it was written down for us in 1 Corinthians 15, the chapter we're in today. It says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And so that leads to the next evidence of the resurrection, and that is eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses who saw the risen Jesus. In that passage I just read, there was this early Christian creed, Paul recounted that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at one time after his resurrection. And he says that the majority of them are still alive today, at the time of his writing, and could confirm what Paul wrote. But then Paul adds in verse 8, he said, And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Not only did a risen Jesus appear to all of these people, but Paul is saying, I saw him alive too. And given the early date of Paul's information, as well as his personal acquaintance with the people involved, these appearances cannot be dismissed as just legends. Again, people would have been around to dispute the claims, and yet they did not. There are multiple independent sources testifying to Jesus' appearance after his death and resurrection. All four of the gospel writers give an account of the resurrection. Now, as I stated earlier, these writings were circulated within the lifetime of men and women who were alive at the time of the resurrection. Those people certainly could have confirmed or denied their accuracy. The writers of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, had either been eyewitnesses to the resurrection, in the case of Matthew and John, or they were relating the accounts of the eyewitnesses of the actual events. There was a man named Sir Walter Ramsey, and he spent 15 years trying to undermine the credibility of Luke as a historian and refute the reliability of the New Testament. And after 15 years of trying to refute it, he finally concluded this. He said that Luke is a historian of the first rank. He said this author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. We can't just discount the, what the gospel writers wrote about the resurrection because the writers were believers. They were believers because of the evidence for the resurrection. Therefore, they wrote down these accounts. Two leading authorities on the resurrection, Gary Habermas and Michael Icona, wrote in the case for the resurrection of Jesus that friends and foes of Jesus saw Jesus not once but many times over a period of 40 days. We're told that these numbers included both men and women, hard-hearted Peter and soft-hearted Mary Magdalene, indoors and outdoors. So just real quickly, I want to talk about just some of these eyewitnesses 
some of these eyewitnesses to the resurrection. So in that time, some of you know, that the people lived in a very patriarchal society. Women were considered second-class citizens, unfortunately. And yet women were the first witnesses to the empty tomb. Dr. William Lane Craig explains that when you understand the role of women in the first century Jewish society, what's really extraordinary is that the empty tomb story should feature women as the discoverers of the empty tomb in the first place. Women were on a very low rung of the social ladder in the first century Israel. He said that women's testimony was regarded as so worthless that they weren't even allowed to serve as legal witnesses in the Jewish court of law. Can you imagine? Sorry, sorry ladies, but you couldn't, you couldn't have served as a witness in a court being a female. In light of this, it is absolutely remarkable that the chief witnesses to the empty tomb are these women. Any legendary account, any later legendary account, would have certainly portrayed some, some men as discovering the tomb, maybe Peter or John. The fact that women are the first witnesses to the empty tomb is most plausibly explained by the reality that, like it or not, they were. They were the discoverers of the em empty tomb. Meaning, if you were to invent an account about Jesus rising from the dead in that day, you would not invent the primary witnesses as people that no one would believe. The one thing you wouldn't do is to have women as witnesses, especially one with such a shady past as Mary Magdalene, who was a prime witness. And yet these early Christians, they suck to the story, even though people would have said, yeah, those are unreliable witnesses. And the fact that they insisted upon this version of the story actually gives their account that much more validity. If it were made up, they would have airbrushed Mary Magdalene right out of the story. Let's not forget about people like the doubting disciple, Thomas, that we talked about last week. Thomas said that he would not believe in, in this resurrection claim without solid evidence. But then he met the risen Savior, the risen Jesus, saw the scars in his hands and feet and side, and convinced, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Or how about James? James was the half-brother of Jesus, and Scripture tells us that Jesus' family was actually skeptical, uh, skeptical about his identity as the Messiah. I, I mean, think about it. Those of you who have brothers, what would it take for you to believe that your brother is the Messiah? And some of you are like, oh my word, right? Like, it would have to be some incredible miracle. Like, he would have to die and rise from the dead. Yeah, Exactly. It wasn't until James saw the risen Jesus and he was convinced. That's what happened to James. There were hundreds of eyewitnesses over the course of 40 days who saw and interacted with the resurrected Jesus. The last line of evidence I want to present is the endurance, the endurance of the disciples. So think of the situation that the disciples were in following Jesus' crucifixion. Their, their leader was dead. Their whole knowledge of a Messiah was one who would triumph over Israel's enemies, not a Messiah who would be shamefully executed as a criminal. Jew Jewish beliefs about the afterlife were also very, very vague. They were kind of murky. They thought more of a general resurrection of the dead at the end of the world, not someone rising from the dead to glory and immortality. And yet, the original disi disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. What made these disciples go from hiding out in, this, in a closed room after the crucifixion, hiding like cowards, to then going everywhere and telling the message of a risen Christ? Maybe there was some, some benefit for their efforts, right? Like, was there prestige or wealth in proclaiming that? Increased social status or, or material benefits? No. Quite the opposite. As a reward for their efforts, those early Christians were beaten, stoned to death, thrown to lions. They were, they were crucified. They were tortured. Many of these eyewitnesses to the resurrection willfully and resolutely endured prolonged torture and death rather than taking back their testimony. According to Pliny's letter to Trajan and other historical accounts, most Christians could end their, their suffering simply by renouncing their faith. And yet, most of them did not. 
most opted to endure the suffering and the, and, and the persecution and proclaim Christ's resurrection to their death. James, again, the half-brother of Jesus that I just mentioned, didn't believe Jesus to be the Messiah until after the resurrection. Once he saw Jesus, he was unrelenting in his preaching and in his planting of churches, so much so that he died for his faith. Paul, this man who had sought to, to persecute the church, to put an end to these followers of Jesus, had an encounter with the risen Jesus, and it completely changed him. He went on to proclaim the gospel all over the world, and under the rule of Emperor Nero, he was put to death for his faith by beheading. Of the remaining 11 disciples after Judas Iscariot hung himself, all of them, except for one, died because of their belief in Jesus as the Messiah and his resurrection. John was the only one who was not killed for his faith. Instead, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos because of his faith in the resurrected Jesus. Matthias, who was the, the, the new apostle that replaced Judas, he went to Syria to preach the gospel, and he was put to death by burning for his faith in a resurrected Jesus. Uh, uh, James, the son of Zebedee, he was executed by the sword under the rule of Herod for his faith. Thaddeus, who was also known as Judas, preached the gospel around Syria, Iraq, and Turkey, and we believe that he might have been killed by arrows because of his faith in Jesus. Uh, let's see, Simon the Zealot, he ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to their sun god. And we believe he was possibly sawn in half for his faith in Jesus. James, the son of Alphaeus, is believed to have, been ministered, to have ministered in Syria, and he was stoned and then clubbed to death because of his faith. Bartholomew traveled throughout India, Armenia, Ethiopia, and South southern Arabia, spreading the gospel, and he was martyred for his faith. Matthew ministered in Persia and Ethiopia, and it's believed that he was stabbed to death because of his belief in Jesus as a resurrected Jesus. Philip ministered in Carthage in Asia Minor, where he converted the wife of a Roman proconsul. And in retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly tortured and put to death. Thomas, our doubting Thomas, he was so convinced of the resurrection that he went around and ministered in India, and he was speared to death for his testimony about Jesus. Andrew preached the gospel throughout Asia Minor, and he was crucified. And then Peter, remember cowardly Peter, who denied Jesus three times? What turned him around to be such a bold witness? The resurrection. And under Emperor Nero's rule, Peter was so bold that he requested when he was put to death, to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be put to death in the same way as Jesus. What turned these cowardly disciples into bold witnesses? The resurrection. The immediate rise of the church so soon after Jesus' death and the dedication, the endurance of these followers of Jesus continues to point to the accuracy of the resurrection. If it didn't happen, at least one of them, at least some of them, some of these cowardly disciples, they would have backed off, right? They would not have died for a lie. In the case for Christ by Lee Strobel, he talked about uh, the late Sir Lionel Luck, who this was a, a brilliant attorney whose amazing 245 consecutive murder acquittals earned him the place in the Guinness World Book of Records as the world's most successful lawyer. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth twice. This former justice and diplomat subjected the historical facts about the re resurrection to his own rigorous analysis for several years and then he finally said this, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, meaning there's more resurrections to come, including your resurrection. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, 
so in Christ all will be made alive. Paul had stated earlier that there are some major implications if the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen. But there are also some major implications as well if Jesus has been raised from the dead. It means this, that there is the resurrection of the dead, meaning our bodies that we live in right now, they're going to wear out. They're going to wear down. They're going to die. But our souls will be resurrected. It means that our preaching is not useless. It is worthwhile. What we do, what we proclaim matters. It means that our testimony is not a lie, but it is true. It means that our faith is not futile. It is purposeful. It means that we can be made alive in Christ. We're no longer dead in our sins. It means rather than being lost, we can be saved. Rather than being pitied, Christians should be excited. Like, this is our Super Bowl today, guys, right? We serve a resurrected, living Jesus. And it means this, that there is hope. Hope for this life and the life to come. Because if God has the power to raise Jesus from the dead, then he certainly has the power to conquer any obstacle we face. If Jesus can raise from the dead, then he can certainly raise up our lives that were dead in sin to new life, to become new creations here on earth. If Jesus can defeat the grave, then he can certainly raise up these, us from physical death to eternal life. Because of the power of the resurrection, because of the power of our God through his son, Jesus Christ, death has no power over us. Paul would continue in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is true, will, that is written, will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. And then let's read this last verse together, verse 57. Let's read it with me. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death does not get the final word because Jesus lives. So as we close in prayer today, here's what, here's what I'd like for you all to do. Where you're seated, I would like for you guys to, to pray. Just pray silently. And thank God for his power over death and the hope that we can have because of Jesus' resurrection. Let's spend some time thanking him for that. And then I'd like you to ask God that he would reveal something to you. Ask God, how do you want me to live in response to what Jesus has done for me? How do you want me to live in light of the crucifixion and the resurrection? How do you want me to live in response to Jesus paying the price for my sins? How do you want me to respond, God? Let's pray that. Heavenly Father, I thank you that some 2,000 years ago, that when all seemed lost when Jesus was crucified and his followers were hiding in fear, that that wasn't the end of the story. And that on that Sunday morning, death could no longer hold Jesus in that tomb. And that he burst forth, rising to life. And because of that, God, we can have hope. We can have a future. We can be raised to new life here on this earth and raised to eternal life when we die. And so, God, I pray that we would not hold back this message of hope to the world, that Jesus Christ died for our sins and that he conquered death and sin and the grave and gives us hope. May we pass that message on. May we respond to that message with our lives given wholly over to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So before we close and
uh, and, and sing some song, a song here. Um, if you have questions and still want to text those in, get them in like now while we're singing and there's going to be a video after that. I'll, I'll go over those questions and come back and answer them as best as I can. Uh, but also, you know, I asked you this question, like how does God want you to respond to this? If you have a response to make today, if you have a decision to make in light of the fact that Jesus died for your sins and rose again, maybe that decision that you need to make is a, is a, is a response by placing your faith in Jesus, wholly trusting in him to save you, in the work that he did to save you, confessing that belief, repenting of your sin and following through with baptism maybe. Maybe that's the decision you need to make today. We're, we're going to have some of our ministers over here in the fireside room to your right. They would love to talk with you. So during this song, if you have a decision to make, you can go on over there. Or maybe you just need someone to pray for you. They would love to do that as well. Um, so if you have a decision to make during this song, head, head on over there. But will you stand and will you sing with us? Someone asked, uh, how do you know so much about hairspray? Thank you for that question, you sinner. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the, another question that came in was uh, maybe explain the, the timing of the three days in the tomb. You know, was Jesus buried two days or three days, Friday to Sunday? How does that work? So, um, so there's some speculation on some things as, as far as, you know, traditionally we believe that Jesus died on a Friday and uh, about 3 p.m. And so he was in the tomb Friday and Saturday and then Sunday morning resurrected. Uh, but some are saying, well, that's not a full three days. Um, there, there is some speculation uh, about how the Jews counted Sabbath days. So um, Sabbath is a weekly thing, which is Saturday. Um, but some believe that also holy days were considered Sabbath days as well. So maybe that that was Friday was counted as a Sabbath and a Saturday. And so really he died on a Thursday. I, I'm not totally uh, convinced of that argument, but that is an argument that is out there. But again, I'm not, I'm not really convinced of that. I think more it's a translation issue instead of talking about after three days. If you read the scripture, it more, more often says on the third day, Jesus rose on the third day. So Day one, Friday. Day two, Saturday. And on the third day, Sunday, he rose. But a great question, and there is some debate uh, around that. Well, thank you guys for, for coming today. Um, and we'd love to have you back and join us in this series. We're going to tackle some tough stuff here and uh, address it with honesty. Um, but if you are new with us today, we'd love to get a chance to meet you, get to know you. We're going to have some people at Beginning Point out in the lobby and have some information for you if you'd like. We'd love to help you get connected. So take a, take a walk out there at the end of the service and uh, get to know some people. Well, let's go ahead and before we close, let's stand and pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, over and over and over, we, we say thank you. And our, our words fall short of the gratitude that we have for you and for your love for us and for what you've done for us. So I pray that our, our lives also would express that gratitude in how we live. In light of that resurrection that changed everything, may it change us as well. God, I pray as we go from here, we would be your representatives to this world, carrying the hope that we have because Jesus lives. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a great Easter.